keep on the original list.
हेलो 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 डस इट वर्क ओके dear uh, fellows members and guests <coughs> a very warm welcome to all of you for this uh, display and presentation by mark schwartz on the boston postal history but before we start i would like to ask the onsec to tell us about the fire notice and the numbers in attendance hello there are no fire drills planned for today thankfully uh, but if the alarm does go off, please please, enter, please leave by the back door there, or the door here, down the stairs, out the front door, turn right, turn right again, and then we will count you off. So we have today a nice round figure in the number of fellows and members here. We have 100 exactly, which is really good. Uh, we also have five guests. We have five overseas members, Patrick Masalis, of course, <laughs> Bart, Bart Willikins and Ulia Maras, who are regulars, Charles Shree from the USA, and Mark Schwartz, our speaker, also from the USA. We also have three members who are here for the first time. Uh, we have Ian Stewart, we have Mark Schwartz, and we have Andrew Harris. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And now I would like to ask Mark for the presentation. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, thank you, Patrick, for inviting me here tonight. And thank you all for coming. You're a very welcoming group, and for that I'm appreciative. If you understand the colonial postal history of Boston, you understand the American postal system of the time. Because pretty much everything that happened in the American postal system happened in Boston and it often happened first. Boston had the first post office in the original 13 colonies. It had the first paper currency used to pay postal bills, and that got Boston into a bit of trouble, as we'll talk about later. It was the major port in the Americas until New York and, and Philadelphia passed it uh, many years later. Boston was founded in 1630. And early on, it looked like this. It is essentially an island in Boston Harbor, connected by a peninsula of land, uh, there we are, to the mainland. And this very narrow strip of land was very important in the history of Boston as we approached the Revolutionary War. Now, as I said, Boston was founded in 1630. And by 1639, it had grown to a city of town of 100 people in a single church. But the Massachusetts General Court felt that it was now time to have a post office so that people could have more confidence that they could get letters from Boston to their family overseas, many of whom were still here, and get similarly get letters back from those folks to hear the most recent news, most recent probably being six to eight months previously. So in 1639, the court established Richard Fairbanks Inn as the first post office in Boston. Richard Fairbanks himself became the postmaster in about four years later. For every letter that came into Fairbanks Inn, either from someone sending it overseas or a sea captain bringing it back, Fairbanks received one penny. I don't think he got rich this way but he probably helped add to his income of running a bar. Now, Fairbanks did not mark his letters as we see letters today. There were no postmarks used. So it's really difficult to determine with certainty that a specific letter went through his post. But those of us who collect this material <coughs> prefer to think that it did. This is the earliest letter in private hands from the original 13 colonies and the earliest letter known to be sent from Boston. It was mailed in 1651 by a man named Samuel Maverick to his son, Nathaniel, in the Barbados, which is also, it's the, also the first incoming letter into Barbados known. Now, I grew up in the Boston area, 
And I had heard of Maverick. It was a station on what we have as our tube, our subway system. It's a square in East Boston where Maverick had land. But until I got this letter, I knew nothing more about him. Suffice to say, there's more in your handout and there's a bit more in the, in the display itself. Now, the Fairbanks post was essentially a sea post. There were no land, land routes connecting towns in the colonies over which letters could be carried. But by the 1670s, we start seeing evidence of a domestic post in Boston and the neighboring areas. The most well-known of these is called the Lovelace Post, set up by Governor Francis Lovelace of New York. Along a road from Boston to New York that still exists, it's called the Post Road, the old Post Road. There were letters delivered along this route, but there was not a lot of enthusiasm for, the, for this operation on the part of the merchants of New York or the merchants of Boston. And the following year, their enthusiasm became moot because the Dutch reoccupied New York and Lovelace had to escape with his life back to London. Any attempt after the British reconquered New York to form a post was hammered by the fact that in a couple years, there was a major Indian uprising called King Philip's War that destroyed most of the towns along that post road. So the idea of an intercolonial post did not progress much further at that time. But there was further evidence of a domestic, of a, a domestic post within Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1673, there is a record in the annals of the Massachusetts General Court allowing for the rate of three pence a mile to a post rider for, the, for his and his horse's expense. Now, by, uh, Fairbanks died in 1667. And it took a while before they realized that we still have a problem with mail getting lost. So shortly after that, they announced the second Boston Postmaster, John Hayward. He was appointed in 1677. He was responsible for now for both sea post and inland post. Now again, we have no markings on letters, but as with the earlier one, we like to believe that this cover went through Hayward's post. This was sent from Boston to Piscataqua, now Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in November of 1685, and it's the earliest letter I'm aware of sent domestically from Boston, other than official letters that were probably carried privately. It was sent to a man named Roger Gordon, a merchant, by a man named John Campbell, his agent in Boston, who 15 years later would become the postmaster of Boston himself. Now at this point, the British decided that there really need to be a, more of a colonial post, pan-colonial, intercolonial. So they granted to a man named Thomas Neal a patent or license to establish that kind of a post in the colonies. He stayed here, but appointed the governor of Connecticut as his deputy. Governor Andrew Hamilton went around to all the assemblies in the various provinces and lobbied them to pass legislation establishing a post and rates for that post, both within and outside of the colony. During that same time, Hamilton appointed a gentleman named Duncan Campbell as postmaster of Boston and of Massachusetts Bay Colony. Campbell established his main office in Boston. He agreed to convey public letters for free, to receive letters from overseas and to convey domestic letters inside Massachusetts Bay and outside Massachusetts Bay. He died about 10 years later and either his son or brother, depending on which source of information you use, succeeded him. And John Campbell's claim to fame is he put the first postal markings on Boston Mail. This is one of those letters that he postmarked. Sent in 1704 from Boston to Portsmouth, Portsmouth again. And you see at the bottom, B, as, B for Boston, four pence the rate from the distance of about 70 miles from Boston to Portsmouth. Now, from then until 1768, Boston markings were always manuscript, either a B or a B with a little O, 
And if it came in by ship, it was marked SH. And we see that for, as I said, about 65 years. Now, this cover was also sent during the period of the Neal patent. But this is actually three covers in one. This is the earliest American free frank in private hands. There are many others in archives, and if you go to the uh, chronicle of the U.S. Philatelic Classic Society about two or three years ago, Tim O'Connor and I put an article in there describing all the free franks that could be found in archives, ending with this one. As you see, it's frank, the t what looks like two Fs is really one, Frank J.C., John Campbell, sent to a judge, Nathaniel Byfield in Bristol, Massachusetts, which is now Bristol, Rhode Island. Now, not only was Campbell the postmaster, he was also the publisher of the newspaper. The first continuing newspaper in the colonies called the Boston Newsletter. This is the masthead from a particular issue covering the time period of October 28th to November 4th, 1706. In this paper was an item. It was an item about a thief who was captured and in his possession were several items, including one silver tankard with certain markings on it. Now this thief was convicted and sent to jail by Judge Nathaniel Byfield. I felt I thought this was a relatively local newspaper, but it turns out this newspaper circulated pretty widely in the colonies because it was seen by a lawyer in New York or in New Jersey who said, I think I know who that tankard belongs to. His client, a Mrs. Sarah Sanford. In this letter that, that, that Millward sent to Campbell, he included additional details about the markings on the tankard. This letter was included inside the Campbell letter I showed you just a minute ago and sent to Byfield with the question, is there sufficient evidence in Millward's letter for me to return the tanker to Mrs. Sanford? Well, in the white space, in the unused space inside Campbell's letter, Byfield wrote back, I won't try to translate this, but he wrote back saying, yes, there is sufficient evidence. Please return the tanker to her post haste. So here we have three letters in one telling a story, a very basic story of an, of, a, of an event that occurred in Boston that was seen as far away as New York, which in that time was quite a distance, combined with a newspaper article. In a nutshell, this kind of thing is why I collect postal history. It gets you really into the, into the time frame, into what was going on in that period. One of the prizes of my collection. Now, the, the Neal patent was not terribly successful. Thomas Neal died penniless despite marrying well. And his associates took over the business, but they couldn't make a go of it either. And in 1710, the British decided to take the post office back under their aegis. Passed what is called here the British Post Office Act of 1710. We call it the Queen Anne Act of 1711 because it was effective in June of the following year. The chief letter office was established in New York. Importantly, they established rates based primarily on distance in shillings and pence. A transatlantic fee of, of one shilling but since very few people in the colonies had shillings and pence, had British money, most of it went back to Britain, they rated these letters initially in pennyweight and grain of coin silver. The benefit of that was coin silver had a direct and constant relationship with British money. Didn't change over time, it was easy to translate. These were the rates under the Queen Anne Act in pennyweight and grain. From one pennyweight, eight grains, or the equivalent of four pence, for a letter sent only a short distance, single sheet letter, up to 21 pennyweights, or 63 pence, for a triple sheet letter sent from Boston to Philadelphia. And while there weren't very many, I'll, I'm able to show you one of them in a few minutes. This letter was sent from Governor Joseph Dudley 
the governor of Massachusetts, to the secretary of the Royal Council for distribution to the other royal governors of New England on uh, September of 1711, announcing the new Postal Act. It reads, herewith you will, find, you will receive the Act of Parliament for the establishment of the post office. This, as far as I know, is the earliest announcement of this new post office in the Americas. Now, the problem is that not only did most people not have British money, shillings and pence, most people didn't have much in the way of silver coins. So it was very difficult to pay their postal bill in that currency. But what Massachusetts had quite early, and what other colonies had a little later, was paper currency. Massachusetts had the first paper currency in the Western Hemisphere. The first in the East was in China. It was printed in order to pay the soldiers after an ill-gotten war between New England and New France. They'd expected to pay the soldiers in the wealth that they gained from New France, but they lost the war. So they printed money. So what happens when you print money? It becomes too easy to print more. And over time, that money becomes worth less and less. Over a period of 31 years, we see very several stages of inflation where the receiver of a letter had to pay more in Massachusetts paper currency called Massachusetts old tenor than they did a few years before. This is the chart that shows you the various inflation factors. In 1723, the, you needed 2.3 Massachusetts shillings to equal one British shilling. By 1752, you needed nine. So you can see it just kept on going. And it wasn't quite German inflation of, of prior, you know, between the wars, but it became difficult to, to keep track of, of these various rates and to keep the accounts in the post office. Now this is one of the earliest letters known that was rated in Massachusetts Old Tenor. It's sent from London to Boston in 1723. The, the rate from, for a letter from zero to 60 miles was four pence. This is a two sheet letter, so four pence times two is eight, plus a one penny ship fee is nine pence, British money, times 2.3 equals one shilling nine pence in Massachusetts Old Tenor. Now I could bore you by going through each and every of these inflation, but I won't, we, and none of us have time. So I'll just, I'll skip through them pretty quickly. Hopefully the clicker will. Okay. But remember, Massachusetts old currency was the, the money that was used within New England only. If you were to send a letter from Boston to Pennsylvania or to Virginia or to New York, they had their own paper money. So you couldn't use Massachusetts old tenor, they wouldn't understand it. So letters sent from Boston outside of New England had to be rated as originally planned in penny weight and grains of coin silver. This is one such letter I mentioned to you before, a triple sheet letter from Boston to Philadelphia. This is one such letter sent in 1743 from London via Boston to Philadelphia. And you can see this is B, S, H for ship, 21 penny weights, 16 grains. Seven penny weights per sheet, three sheets, and a 16 grain or two pence ship fee. It mounts up pretty quickly. Okay, whoops. But in 1753, Benjamin Franklin and William Hunter were appointed deputy postmasters general for the colonies. And they had, had had enough of paper money. They couldn't figure it out. They couldn't keep accounts. They needed one standard to keep accounts. So they said, okay, from now on, all letters, whether they were previously rated in New York money or Massachusetts money, they had to be rated in, in penny weights and grains. But just because it was, it was rated in penny weight and grain didn't mean that the people were able to pay in penny weights and grains. So what you see then is the initial rate at origin is in penny weight and grain. When you get to the destination, if it's another colony, it's rated in their paper money. Here are two letters rated this way. This one goes within New England, rated as a single letter up to 60 miles in 1755, B.O. 
One penny weight, eight grains. Very simple. This letter is a little more complicated. Sent 10 years later from Boston to New York, the, if the rate in penny, in penny weights and grains was BO4, four penny weights. But when it got to New York, it was re-rated as one shilling, eight pence in New York paper currency. So they, they couldn't get rid of paper currency entirely. Now, shortly after that letter is sent, there was a new law passed, the Act of King George. A little later than it was originally planned uh, to reduce rates, Britain needed those higher rates longer because they had, to, they had additional wars to pay for, which usually creates problems with postal rates. This one was enacted in October 16, uh, 1765. It took the initial rate zones of 0 to 60 and 60 to 100 miles and extended them in 100 mile increments. It established a rate from port to port. It was often easier and faster to send a letter from one port to another in the Americas than to try to send it overland. And that was only four pence. And, for, and it codified the two penny ship rate for anything that came into a, an American port and was sent beyond that. First example that was recorded in the Americas was not until December. I suspect there are more out there. So if any, the next shows you're at, keep looking for letters a little bit early on this with these rates on them. And then let me know, I'll, I'll purchase it from you. <laughs> The, the original letter announcing the King George Act was printed in London in June 8th and appeared in this Boston Evening Post paper by August of that year. Still in plenty of time by October to get people accustomed to the new rate schedule. And here is that new rate schedule. You may or may not remember, but these were the same rates in the Queen Anne period. But these are lower. Remember the the rate from Boston to Philadelphia, which is 300 to 400 miles, was seven penny weights. Now it's four. Substantial reduction of almost 50%. When do you think we're, we're apt to see that, uh, that kind of reduction from either the British or the American Post? Now I mentioned that the first markings, <laughs> postal markings on Boston letters uh, came about in 16 and 1703, and they lasted till about 1768. At that point, many cities in the colonies got new large hand stamps from England. New York, Philadelphia, Savannah, uh, Williamsburg, and Boston. The first Boston straight line hand stamp was used for about five years. It was used in various colored inks possibly because the first inks they tried didn't work out well, but your guess is as good as mine on that. Shortly after that, for a four month, five month period, they used a smaller, finer looking hand stamp, not only in Boston, but in the other colonies. But then shortly after that, we have the beginnings of the American War of Revolution. The battles of Lexington and Concord in April, the, uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill a couple months later. And a year later, the British left Boston. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Here is an example of the first Boston hand stamp struck in what's called violet. Now this is a, a quite good example. Most of the examples I've seen are faded. Whether the ink itself faded in the pot, didn't, it was unstable. Whether it fa they fade due to light or not, I don't know. But within six months they had switched to a, a stronger color. Now notice also this letter, we see this first Franklin mark, very similar to the to the marks you have here uh, from about 100 years earlier. And we see these for about 30 to 40 years in use in Boston. Uh, Franklin was very familiar with the post office in, in on London. He liked what uh, Bishop had done, indicating the date the letter was sent, so he copied it here. Now the next letter, you can see it's a slightly different ink. It's a, it's a red or a magenta ink. This letter was sent in 1773 from Boston to Philadelphia, rated four penny weights, but when it got to Philadelphia, it was re-rated one shilling, 10 pence in Pennsylvania paper currency. Here's the second postmark, that smaller, finer postmark 
that the British sent over to, to many of the major post offices in the Americas. This was sent in March of 1775, very shortly before Lexington and Concord, on a letter from Boston to New York, marked again, three pennyweight, eight grains in coin silver, and one shilling, eight pence in New York paper currency. Now at this time, the British were imposing more and more difficulties on the people of Boston. One of which was to abrogate the charter that had been given by the king hundred and some odd years earlier. This made anyone serving in the Massachusetts assembly a traitor, as long as you continue to serve there. And since they were traitors, but since they still wanted to run Massachusetts, they left Boston, they went over the river to Cambridge, and eventually they got about five miles later in Watertown, Massachusetts, and on May 12th, 1775, they established their own post office for the rest of the state, the Massachusetts Provincial Fo Provisional Post. This is the only copy in private hands of that act. There's another copy that sits in the Rhode Island archive, but these are the only two copies known. They set up a main, main post office in Cambridge. They established 13 satellite post offices, complete with postmasters, and established new rates for a relatively short period of time. But it certainly was an important event establishing the independence of the American rebels. Now the siege of Boston started around the time of Lexington and Concord and Battle of Bunker Hill. And the siege was effective primarily because of that spit of land that connected Boston to the rest of Massachusetts that I showed you in the first slide. It was very easy to choke off that, anything coming across that spit of land into Boston to supply the British soldiers on land and in the harbor, as well as the loyalist citizens who remained in Boston. But the Bostonians could choke that, the, the rebels could choke the, the, the goods from the British, but they couldn't really attack the British because they didn't have much in the way of arms uh, for a while, until January of 1776. In late 1775, the Americans had one victory, an unusual victory, but an important one, at Fort Ticonderoga. When the British left, they left 60 tons of cannon and mortar sitting at the fort. So George Washington appointed one of his, his subordinates, a man named Henry Knox, who had previously been a bookseller in Boston, but who was a student of military history and tactics. He said, Knox, I want you to go to Fort Ticonderoga and bring those arms back. Well, it's 300 miles. It's in the dead of winter. There are rivers choked with ice. There's a whole state choked with snow. But Knox accomplished it. And in doing so, he accomplished one of the most stupendous feats of logistics of the war, as quoting one historian. By January of of uh, 1776, he arrived back in Boston. And by March 2nd, they had a plan. They began shelling Boston from Cambridge. Now, it's a bit further from Boston, and this is not a terribly uh, dense part of Boston. Here was most of where of the people lived. So here we have a relatively flat piece of land shelling into, into a, an area of Boston which you're not going to hurt anybody. And they didn't. But they did distract the British. And while the British were distracted one night, 2,000 American rebels took those 60 tons of cannon and mortars and dragged them up Dorchester Heights, which is here, closer to the major port part of Boston and much higher, a tactically uh, excellent position. So they started shelling Boston, and the British couldn't let them go, let this go on. They had no choice but to try to attack Dorchester Heights, but they couldn't do it. A storm came up and blew them back. And because of that, they had to abandon the town. And 
that's really the start of the American Revolution. This letter was written by a British soldier stationed in Boston during the siege. And it describes the last several days of the siege of Boston. It's an incredible document because his accounting does not match the accounting that his general sent to, to Parliament in London. Who was right? I'll leave it to you to decide. To our great surprise, the enemy had thrown up such works on the Dorchester Hill as could not probably have been done with less than 10,000 men. Well, the rebels did it with 2,000. It would not be the first time or the last time that the British underestimated the American rebels. We then found ourselves so insulated all around that a disposition was made for attacking the hills. We had to stop this onslaught. But from the badness of weather, the scheme was abolished, forcing the general to abandon the town. This letter was written on March 18, 1776, aboard a ship eight, five miles outside of Boston along the King's Road. The ship carried British soldiers and loyalists, Boston loyalists, and was one of many ships that left on its way to Halifax. The fact that this letter still exists is incredible. Now the, the rebels were then able to get back into Boston and to reopen the Boston Post Office in April of 1776. This is the earliest letter we know of posted from that reopened Boston Post Office. This letter was sent in May 16th of 1776, a distance of 60 to 100 miles to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We keep talking about Portsmouth letters, wonderful place. Rated two pennyweights, sent to a man named John Langdon, described as a merchant, but he was much more important. He was very important in the Revolutionary War as a soldier and a statesman. But the important thing about this letter is the postmark. It was struck in an incredible gold, yellow gold ink, never seen before, seldom seen later. You may have seen another example of this in a presentation given by a friend of mine, Tim O'Connor, six or seven months ago. He has one a week later. Mine's, mine's earlier. <laughs> now this, this uh, Boston postmark is, appears to be the same one on that 1775 letter I showed you earlier in Magenta. The postmaster at that time was a, was a, was a rebel and a relative of Benjamin Franklin. We believe he kept that postmark, that hand stamp safe until they were able to return to the Boston Post Office and to be used at this, at this time. Now whenever I see this letter, I, there's another story. Benjamin Franklin sat for months in Philadelphia in Constitution Hall while they debated the American Constitution. And the debates were very contentious at times. And during that time, George Washington sat in this wonderful chair which was engraved in its back with a sun with rays emanating from it. And after the Constitution was agreed to and signed, Franklin said, for months I've been wondering whether this is a rising sun or a setting sun. Now I know it's a rising sun. <laughs> well, I like to believe that when they decided to use this sunny yellow gold ink on this letter in 1776, these rebels also knew the sun was rising on a new nation. Thank you. Mark, and now I would like to invite you for the uh, vote of thanks. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Mr. President, fellows, members and guests. I really am delighted to be able to give this vote of thanks to Mark for his superb display of Boston colonial postal history. <coughs> One disappointment though. <laughs> when your compatriot Tim O'Connor came, he came as Benjamin Franklin. Yeah? I, I was expecting you to come as Paul Revere. I wouldn't have expected the horse, but at least the dress. The original, not the one on the 
<laughs> I first came across Mark's Boston exhibit uh, at the Garfield Perry March party in Cleveland, Ohio in 2008. And it was already a significant exhibit. And it has simply grown from there. And I would say probably one of the best Boston exhibits that has ever been put together. It, it, it is superb. And he's talked only about the material that went through to the War of the Revolution. You've also seen quite a bit of material through to the, the use of the uh, first postal stamps. Well, the first postal stamp, of course, was the New York Provisional, but then the, 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 the five and the ten cent stamps. He's got firsts of many things, quite exceptional. You know, you, you don't see them outside uh, archives these days. He also has, I think, uh, the wonderful letters related to the, uh, the, the, the silver tankard. Now, I think there was a mistake there. It should have really been a silver teapot. <laughs> but you can't have everything. One of the things that uh, Mark has, and which I'm very envious of, is the fact that he's, he's got uh, on these frames 19 covers with 5 and 10 cent first issue on, which I think is fantastic. He's also got a New York provisional, and I know that having them is difficult. Having them used outside New York and being accepted in New York is remarkable. Not only has Mark entertained us with quite an amazing display, he's also provided us with an invaluable uh, record of his address, and we thank him very much for that. Nicely presented and produced. Mark. I think we can all see why you won the Champion of Champions in the World Series in, uh, in Sarasota in, in 2015, and why you were shortlisted for the Grand Prix in New York. You richly deserve those recognitions. So if we can join in the usual way to show our appreciation, I'd thank you. Thank you very much, Hugh. Are there any more questions from the members? Who paid for the, the letter, the sender or the receiver? In almost all cases, the letters were paid by the addressee. Very few, you do see every once in a while a paid letter, but it's rare. Any more questions? No. Okay, Mark. Well, um, we have a small uh, present for everyone coming here. And this year, you're very lucky. We have the sesquicentennial medals. Yes. And this is the third one. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, the band. Oh. I also have a certificate for you and something edible. <laughs> <laughs> a box of chocolate. Oh my. Here we <laughs> and <coughs> you because you did a nice job too, a great job. I also have a box for you and your wife. Thank you. Please. Thank you very Thank much. You,
Thank you very much for a wonderful uh, display and a excellent presentation. Um, next, uh, I would like to invite Chris King to um, tell us more about the works in Abchard Lane. Oh, look more than uh, like a like, like look more like Courchevel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's the other picture I'd like the best. Where do I get that from? Um, you know, it was a wonderful traditional postal history exhibit. Of course, the modern postal history exhibit would have included the silver tankard. <laughs> um, what we have here is um, it's great. Patrick's learned to say sesquicentennial. I've learned to s I've, I've learned to say axonometric. <laughs> this is uh, this is an axonometric uh, drawing of <laughs> of the of the library as it will be uh, when we move into Abchurch Lane with the, the, the reading desk, with the... Uh, can, can I just move it forward and get the... Uh, yes, there we are. That's, uh, that's the library. This is um, one of the reading desks. There's a, a little nook over here where you can uh, work, and there's a, a secure reading area sort of here, and Nicola and her cohorts, because by then we hope to have some cohorts, um, are going to be at the back here. But it's nice, I thought, I've shown you empty spaces before, of the meeting rooms. I've shown you empty spaces of the very pretty room on the top floor. Um, but actually to see what it is that we're trying to get to um, as a research and library room I thought would be um, a bit of a treat tonight. Um, we can't afford to get any more of these pretty drawings made. The architects charge for them. Um, but this, um, Nicola keeps telling me this is the heart of the society and I keep refusing to say that for, for fear of upsetting Juliet. So um, anyway, that's what we're trying to pay for, that's what we're trying to move into, and that's what we hope to achieve by um, the middle of June this year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. I was looking for chocolates for you, but unfortunately they didn't have any axonometric ones. <laughs> Um, no, we have seen what our plans are. I think uh, next one should be uh, Peter Coburn to tell us how we will pay for them. Uh, fellows and members, <coughs> Mr. President, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity once again to advise you uh, that if you've read your LP, uh, which um, uh, has arrived, um, you'll find a page which tells you about an auction which we're going to hold in November. And um, apart from the silver tankard, which we're hoping to get, um, we will be looking for um, contributions to that. And um, uh, everybody, I'm sure, somewhere has a, 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 an old shoebox with things in it that they haven't looked at for a few months, a few years, or even a generation or two. So um, do please have a look. And um, if it's uh, of any reasonable value, um, we'd be very, very pleased to see it. Um, that lovely picture is uh, very exciting, um, and it has to be paid for. Um, if you want your name on the door of that one, it's three hundred thousand um, pounds. And I have to, and I have to tell you um, that um, it looks to me as though, at the moment, in the um, the racing stakes of uh, Boston. Um, the, the Americans are ahead. So um, they may well have their name on it unless you guys at home do something about that. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And indeed, I would like to thank our American friends because uh, the donations we get from over the pond are really impressive. Thank you very much to all our American friends. Uh, <coughs> Another uh, news I can announce you today is that Council has decided to offer live membership to, um, uh, to those who wish to do so. So 150 members can apply for it. There, uh, we limited it to 150 because otherwise there would be no money left in the future to run the society. 
So you will learn everything about it uh, from uh, tomorrow onwards because I intend to send my newsletter tomorrow and announce this and then uh, it will be repeated in the LP. So if you want to apply for live membership, it will be 3,000 pounds and it has to be paid before uh, July this year. Really, yes, because the bills are coming in now and we have to pay them now. Um, Frank Walton also asked to say a word to you. Thank you, Patrick. Just once in a while, the philatelic world gets its act together in diaries. I don't know how many times I've ever heard people moan about the fact that diaries don't quite line up. Uh, but this, this year they're working terribly well. Let's pretend for a minute that you want to put an eight-frame exhibit into London 2020. How are you going to do that? Well, the first thing you do is to get it qualified. And let's pretend you had a bit of foresight and you actually entered five frames in Stampex next week. Would you believe, assuming you of course you get a large or or better, that the closing date for Wu Hun is the day after Stampex closes? And if you do well in Wu Hun, then two weeks after Wu Hun closes is the closing date for London 2020 for applications. So I stand here in front of you a gentleman with a very large empty briefcase as the commissioner to go to Wu Hun. At the moment I've got one exhibit. So can I please just urge you, if you do wish to enter an international exhibition, which will allow you to qualify for London 2020, can I please urge you to see me afterwards or just indeed uh, pop me an email and I will send you the application forms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. The next meeting is uh, next week, next Thursday, St. Valentine's Day. Uh, Dominica by Simon Richards. The vote of thanks will be exceptionally at 4 p.m. and not at 5 p.m. The reason is I have to catch the 5 p.m. train back to Belgium for Valentine evening. <laughs> But but uh, you won't miss me that much because um, I will arrange a Caribbean reception downstairs and by 5 p.m. you will have forgotten that I even have been here. <laughs> <laughs> and there will be, for everyone present, there will be something Valentine edible uh, that you can take home and have good points uh, in the evening. The current standing display for January and February is prepaid reply cards by Eric Scherer. The material will remain in the frames until 5.30, you said, uh, maybe 6, 5.30, 6 o'clock. And wine and snacks are served downstairs until 6, it's already, oh, <laughs> it's 10 to 6. Okay, the material is about to leave the frames. <laughs> 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 and wine and snacks will be served um, um, from now onwards. Thank you very much. <laughs>